Welcome to a brand new episode of the Jam Pack Report today for October the 8th of 2020. Of course, my name is Samuel Adams, and this is a daily gaming news podcast meant to bring you the hottest news you need to know from around the industry. Hosted on YouTube and podcast services around the world five days a week, it is your one-stop shop for everything you need to know. So if you enjoy the show and you like what you see, hit that subscribe button and keep coming back for more. But yesterday, for PlayStation 5 fans anticipating the release of the next console, we finally got our look inside the hardware itself, and it came directly from PlayStation. A PlayStation 5 teardown has revealed a huge cooling system and an SSD expansion bay alongside the rest of the internal components. Sony has conducted an official and strangely relaxing teardown of the PlayStation 5 that provides more than a few insights into its imminent game console. For one, it has an elaborate cooling system. There is a large 120mm fan that draws in air from both sides, and a heatsink whose shape and airflow reportedly deliver the kind of cooling you would expect from a vapor chamber like that used in the Xbox Series X. It even uses liquid metal as the thermal interface material and the AMD-made 8-core CPU to ensure long-term cooling performance. It's also apparent that you won't have much trouble adding another SSD. Both of the curvy white panels come off easily, exposing a conspicuous SSD bay where you can install a PCIe 4.0 based M.2 drive. Just don't expect to replace the 825GB of default storage that's built into the PlayStation 5's motherboard. You can also remove the panels to clear out dust from two dedicated catchers. The PlayStation 5 teardown also gives you a good look at the CPU itself. It's 16GB of GDDR6 memory and the custom SSD controller. The 350 watt power supply is built in so you won't have an ugly brick hanging off the back of your machine. There are still some questions left about the PlayStation 5, including its still mysterious interface. We would not be surprised if a third party teardown went further. However, this might just answer many of your questions about the design. Like Microsoft, Sony was interested in a design that runs quietly, not just quickly. So, the size of the PlayStation 5 has been the talk of the town over the course of the past six months, really, since the console was revealed. It is a very large console. In fact, it's about, if I remember correctly, three inches taller uh, than the Xbox Series X. It's going to take up a lot of space, and for those that have a cramped spot in their TV entertainment center, it might not fit. I mean, it's legitimately something you should consider and measure before you plan where you put your console. Now, of course, during this teardown video, we also got to look at how the stand itself works. There's essentially a small screw on the bottom of the console that you can move uh, and essentially change where the stand lays. So you can lay it horizontally or vertically, In either way, it looks like it's built to be in that position. Which which personally I think is a nice little touch. Uh, now in terms of the size itself as we were discussing, uh, it is big because of the airflow that it needs to stay quiet. If you look at the PlayStation 4 Pro right now, it is very compact. It is just a little bit bigger really uh, than the base PlayStation 4. And so when you compare these two approaches, you have one uh, that brings minimalism and, and a small footprint into consideration, and you have one that is essentially trying to minimize the the amount of audio that you are going to be hearing from the console itself, the amount of external noise coming from fans, you really want to be able to have an experience that doesn't interfere with the sound that's coming off of the television. And there have been times, especially whenever I was still playing on a base PlayStation 4, that the fan ramps up big time during these very, very uh, power-hungry games. Uh, you are going to be able to hear the console on the PlayStation 4, and it can take away from the experience, especially if you might be a player that sits at a desk and you have your PlayStation 4 directly beside your mouse and keyboard, well, there you have it. It's right there, probably interfering with your audio quality. If you're on a mic, it's a big deal for a lot of people. And so with all of that being taken into consideration, the hardware breakdown was a good way to show exactly what you can expect from the hardware on day one. Now, one thing that's very cool is the liquid metal cooling. 
That really intrigues me, and I like it because after five years of development, this console has certainly gone through a lot of iterations, and it shows that there is deep thought being put into how this system is being cooled, and how it will be able to run at a maximum capacity, because it is a very powerful console. It is essentially a modern gaming PC, more than anything. Uh, and so I think that there's a lot of innovation here, and it was a very cool video to see. Now, if you do want to check it out, it's up right now on the official PlayStation uh, Twitter account, the YouTube page, probably the Instagram. Uh, you can find it where you find your PlayStation news, uh, but a very cool video that is worth your time. On top of that, the trophy system is getting some changes, and for a lot of people, most of them are already live with more to come out in the coming weeks. This is coming directly from the PlayStation blog. You've all heard that satisfying sound when a trophy pops up on the corner of your screen. There is the sense of accomplishment when that ultra-rare platinum trophy is unlocked after hours of pursuing. Trophies were first introduced on PlayStation 3 and have been an integral part of the PlayStation gaming experience. Today, we're excited to announce we are bringing some enhancements to the trophy system, including new trophy levels. The first thing you will notice is the big change to your trophy level. We are increasing the trophy level range from the current 1 to 100 to 1 to 999. So following this update, your trophy level will automatically be remapped to a new level within this new range based on the trophies you've earned to date. For example, if your current trophy level is 12, your new level will jump to somewhere in the low 200s. The exact level will depend on the number and upgrade, excuse me, uh, on the number and grades of trophies you have acquired. There will be no changes to the trophies already earned or trophy information, such as unlock requirements. A new level calculation structure. We've implemented a new trophies level calculation system that is more optimized and rewarding. Players will progress quicker through the early levels and levels will increase more consistently. Platinum trophies will count more toward your level progression, making them even more valuable. New trophy level icons. With an expanded level range, we are also updating the trophy level icon on PlayStation 5 as well as PlayStation app at a later date. Currently, the trophies icon is just a single gold star, but we are adding a few variants. Bronze, levels 1 through 299, silver, levels 300 through 599, gold, levels 600 through 998, and platinum, level 999. The icons will also have a subtle distinction to visually suggest how close you are to the next level. Lastly, just for clarity, trophies that you've earned on previous PlayStation systems will come with you to PlayStation 5, just as they have in previous generation transitions. The new trophy levels will be reflected in all locations that, trophy are, excuse me, that trophies are shown, including past systems, PlayStation app, and My PlayStation. All of these updates will be automatically implemented on the system side starting later tonight in North America and tomorrow, which is now today, in Europe. We are committed to offering an even better experience for our fans as we head into the next generation of gaming, and we can't wait for everyone to start racking up trophies in all of the amazing upcoming games that are launching on PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5. So, the trophy system has been something that fans have been discussing for quite some time, because... An iteration has been a long time coming. Trophies and achievements, whether you love them or you hate them or you find them uh, existent and you don't care that they're there, are a big part of modern gaming. Because for a lot of people, including myself, there's something special about that level of achievement where you see a notification pop up and you did something cool. I love trophies and I love achievements. However, especially on the PlayStation, Trophies have never had that same level of value uh, that I feel a gamer score has on Xbox. And I still am not 100% sure that this new system is going to really make the difference that fans are wanting. Now that being said, it is a step in the right direction uh, because essentially now your trophies count more and you can see yourself improving and it encourages you to play more, which is essentially the goal of trophies. You want to be able to trophy hunt and get that last achievement. You want to continue pursuing that goal. Uh, and so I think that a couple of iterations could change this system and make it even better than it already is with these new enhancements. Uh, specifically, some kind of actual numerical value uh, that is applied to every trophy. And again, I'm partial to the achievement system on Xbox because I know what a five gamer score achievement is. I know what a 50 gamer score achievement is. And I can see my gamer score and I look at it and I know how much it took to achieve that. 
Now the same could be said for the trophy system, uh, but I like having a literal numerical value that shows how much each individual trophy is worth. This doesn't really place a value on the trophies themselves from what I'm getting here. Uh, it's all just gathering in your own trophy collection and you are displaying your trophy level, which is still, again, very impressive. Uh, now, I've seen a lot of people posting their screenshots where they went from, say, level 21 to level 400 and something, etc., etc., uh, and it's cool to see because fans should have something to be excited about going into the next generation. It's a very exciting time, and I'm looking forward to seeing how these changes impact how people experience games and the trophies they bring. But it's cool to see that Sony is listening, they're iterating, and they're not just going with the same system over and over again, because if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It is actually an iteration, and it is making the entire experience better, which I think is a pretty cool little asset. Now, if you're looking to earn some trophies, you might want to pick up Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, which has revealed a huge feature is finally coming to console versions. That is right, on PS4, 5, Xbox One, Series X, and S versions of the game, you are going to be getting a field of view slider all the way up to 120. At the moment, it's unclear if the feature will be exactly implemented like it is on PC, but we should know soon because it will be available in the upcoming beta of the game. For those that don't know, FOV Slider stands for Field of View Slider. As the name suggests, it allows players to tweak and mess around with their field of view. It's a feature console players have been asking for for years, but until now, it has been a feature exclusive to the PC version of the game. What makes this news all the more surprising is that there has not been any leak claiming this was coming, which is surprising because it's clearly already been implemented in the game, and thus in the game's files. That said, in a world of crossplay, perhaps it's not as surprising as we think. Field of view is incredibly important, especially in competitive games, because essentially instead of having a 60 degree field of view, you are able to expand it and you are able to see more of your surroundings. So literally, if you do play on the highest field of view, it will almost have a fisheye lens effect for lack of a better term, but you'll be able to see somebody coming from the right before you would normally even register that they are there on consoles. And again, in the world of crossplay, that's a very big deal. Because for competitive PC players, crank that field of view all the way up. And on top of that, you will get used to it. Because I've gotten used to it. Any game that I play is a game that I crank up the field of view. From Gears, which is a third-person cover-based shooter, all the way down to a first-person shooter like a Cyberpunk or like a Modern Warfare. I've got to have a higher field of view if it is possible. Uh, and it's cool to see that console is finally getting that. Now, what's shocking to me is that it sounds like this is coming to all versions of the game, including current-gen and next-gen. Why didn't we do this before? Is it a crossplay thing? Because I really could have used this all the way back to like, you know, the beginning of the PlayStation 4's life cycle, but I digress. I'm glad that it's coming and I'm excited to see it implemented in this year's Call of Duty. Now, if you're into the mini console little craze that we have going on, Sega's next retro console could be the Dreamcast Mini, says producer. Yosuke Okunari discussed the future of Sega's mini consoles in the latest issue of Famitsu via Ryo Takya hmm, 2089. Sure, let's go with that. Uh, and translated by Silicon Era. The publisher's latest mini console, the Game Gear Micro, was released exclusively in Japan this month, and Okunari suggested that for his next project, he would like to deliver hardware that had stronger global potential. For the next mini, we are considering everything that has been imagined by everyone, he said. Of course, it doesn't mean we can realize all of them. We are also thinking about projects that nobody has imagined. The Game Gear Micro is only sold domestically in Japan. When we do the next one, I feel like the project scope would be much bigger as we gaze upon the world, he added. Okunari said the next mini console would likely take more time to bring to market than the Game Gear Micro, so we won't be able to release it at this time the next year or two years after the Mega Drive Mini. We can't make it that quickly, he said. I think for the next one, we may go with a concept close to the Mega Drive Mini. If I have to say some names, it could be an SG-1000 Mini or a Dreamcast Mini. Dreamcast was Sega's final home console, marking the end of the Japanese company's near 20-year stint in the console hardware market. However, despite its short lifespan, the console produced many critically acclaimed game franchises, including Shinmu, Soul Calibur, Fantasy Star Online, Crazy Taxi, Jet Set Radio, and Rez. The console enjoyed a strong launch in North America backed by a significant marketing campaign, but ultimately sales declined as Sony's PlayStation 2 arrived on the market. 
Despite price cuts and critically acclaimed game releases, Sega decided to uh, discontinue the Dreamcast on March 31st, 2001 and restructure itself as a third-party publisher. The Game Gear Micro released in Japan on October 6th for around $50, the palm-sized version of the 1990 handheld measures 80mm wide, 43mm tall, and 20mm deep with a 1.15-inch display and features a mono speaker and headphone jack. The Mega Drive Mini was released worldwide in 2019 and came with 42 games, two wired control pads, and a USB power adapter, plus power and HDMI cables. A Dreamcast Mini makes sense in the world of today's gaming space because, again, you have the NES Mini, you have the SNES Mini, you might as well have a Dreamcast Mini, uh, and if Sega can find a way to produce this, then it's probably going to be a pretty big hit, especially with collectors. Uh, the Dreamcast was a very significant console. Again, one of the biggest games that comes to mind is Crazy Taxi, which remains a very important game to this day. Uh, it's a very uh, important cultural moment. The Dreamcast captures the late 90s, in my mind. Uh, it is, in a way, a lot like the PlayStation 1, where when you see a Dreamcast, it encapsulates an entire era. Uh, and that's a really unique space to be in for a console. And I think that that warrants a remake for the Dreamcast and a return to market for a miniature version of the console. I would super be down to buy one. Uh, why not? You know, it would look fantastic next to the other classic consoles if you are already a collector of those as well. So stay tuned, it sounds like this is not going to be coming anytime soon, and it very well could not come at all, but the Dreamcast Mini is certainly on the minds of those making these little mini consoles happen. But to round out today's show, if you're looking for something to play this weekend or to check out, Steam's Game Festival Autumn Edition is now on, featuring hundreds of playable demos, and you've got one week to get through them. The increasingly regular occurrence that is Valve's Steam Game Festival has returned today, the 7th of October, for its Autumn Edition, bringing with it hundreds of playable limited-time demos. This autumnal reemergence for the event runs from today until next Tuesday, the 13th of October, and marks the fourth Steam Game Festival in less than a year. Additionally, as was the case with Valve's summer showing, it's another rather unwieldy affair. While last year's inaugural Steam Game Festival featured just 13 playable demos, Valve has been steadily ratcheting up the numbers with each new outing, and this latest event promises hundreds of new demos, a fantastic proposition in terms of choice, but a pretty intimidating number too, given that most will probably only be sticking around for the festival's duration. Alongside the various demos, Valve is also promoting a schedule of developer interviews and live streams, offering a deeper delve into a wide selection of upcoming games. Additional details can be found on the Steam Game Festival Autumn Edition's launch page. Because I'm a sim nerd, Matt Wales writes at Eurogamer, I'll be making a beeline for Lawn Industries per Aspera demo, but Kid Fox Games' nonlinear tech exorcist investigatory mystery Lucifer Within Us also managed to catch my eye during a preliminary browse. Of course, if you happen to stumble across anything that leaves you sufficiently enthused, do feel free to share your recommendations down below. In a world where... Festivals, literal festivals, in a world where game events are not being held, this is kind of the next best thing. I appreciate Valve going in and saying, hey, developers, bring it in. Do you have a demo? Let's let people play your demo. It's a great way to market your game, and I'll be diving in this weekend to try out some games, especially since I'm getting back into PC gaming, because I want to find something new. And to have hundreds of demos at your disposal is a fantastic way to find out new games that are coming out that you might like of all sizes. So if you do have a PC and you do play games on it, then you might want to dive into the Steam Game Festival Autumn Edition, which is out now, and you can find the landing page directly on the Steam home front. But that rounds out today's episode of the Jam Pack Report. If you enjoyed today's show, drop me a like down below and let me know what you think about the PlayStation 5 teardown as well as the new trophy system. Going into the next generation, is this getting you excited? Are you hyped for what Sony has on the table or are you going with Xbox? Or maybe both. Or maybe you're playing PC. Would love to hear your thoughts down below. But until tomorrow, you guys have a fantastic rest of your day. I'll talk to you soon and peace.